Um, all right, well, thanks for joining me this evening. As I mentioned before, this is Native Plants for New England Gardens. Uh, this is definitely a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I'm uh, a native plant aficionado. I love native plants, love working with native plants. And so tonight is a little bit of an opportunity for me to share some of that passion with all of you. Uh, this is a great shot of, uh, of Tower Hill. We have lots of amazing native plants at, uh, at Tower Hill Botanic Garden, um, but fortunately our garden is much broader than simply native plants. We have uh, just an amazing collection um, of plants from around the world, um, including our, our daffodil field, which um, I have to say is pretty much in full bloom at the moment. Um, we're actually pretty excited to be able to harvest some of the daffodils out of the daffodil field later on this week to donate to um, uh, local medical centers. So we're excited that the daffodil field will have some kind of a, a life beyond, um, uh, you know, our little uh, our little views. The staff are really appreciating the daffodils this this season, but unfortunately, our visitors are not because of current circumstances. Um, daffodils are not native. Uh, they're a, a, a early spring flowering plant, early spring flowering bulb uh, that is uh, naturalized in our area. We see them all over the place, mostly in people's gardens or the edges around people's gardens, um, but they're not native. Um, and so, what I want to do tonight is talk a little bit about what it means to be a native plant, why that's important why you might be interested in growing native plants in your home garden. Uh, and then I'll run through a pretty long list of um, some of my favorite native plants. Um, and the list is uh, um, not as long as it could be, just in the interest of time. Um, so I'll give you a, a resource at the end that's a fantastic way to see um, quite a number more uh, native plants. Um, I would like to say that most of the images this evening are uh, photographs by Dan Jaffe, who was uh, co-author with me of a book called Native Plants for New England Gardens um, back in 2017, maybe 2018. Um, and uh, so Dan's a fantastic photographer. There are a few other photographs in this, in this slideshow that are either mine or other people's, um, but, but I have Dan to thank for most of the photographs that you see this evening. Um, so first and foremost, why would we want to use native plants in our garden? Uh, I think it's important that we recognize that uh, native plants are all around us, that we have a, a millions of uh, plants to choose from. Um, we have a lot of fantastic native plants like the ones that you see in the image here. Um, first, for me as a gardener, I think one of the reasons that I look to native plants is because there's some really incredibly beautiful native plants um, to choose from. As you can see from the phlox and foam flower in this image, uh, they're, they're certainly very beautiful native plants out there, um, but native plants also have a lot more to offer beyond beauty. Um, so as a fairly lazy gardener, I like, to, uh, I like the, the satisfaction of knowing that when I choose native plants for my garden, uh, when they're properly sited in the landscape, um, they're not going to need a whole lot of care for me because they're adapted to uh, your region's climate, soil, and ecology. Um, so native plants have grown, they've evolved over uh, millennia to, to grow in your specific area. Um, so choosing them, uh, if they're properly sited, like I mentioned, they don't need fertilizer, they don't need irrigation, um, they can really be pretty self-sufficient uh, when, you, when you have them and they're established in your landscape. Um, one important uh, reason for choosing native plants is that they provide great habitat for native pollinator, pollinators and for wildlife. Um, and that's a really important component of choosing native plants for the landscape is making sure that our gardens are giving back, making sure that our gardens exist as habitat, not just as beautiful places for us to admire and appreciate, uh, but also uh, great places for uh, wildlife to take up residence in. Um, and the, it's, it's amazing the number of uh, deep ecological interactions that exist between insects uh, and plant life and between insects and birds and insects and other animals. Um, and I always say the best way to attract pollinators to your garden uh, is not with a flower, um, but the best way to attract uh, butterflies in particular and moths um, to your garden is to uh, grow a host plant. Um, a lot of times host plants are uh, not the plants that we think of like the image that you see here, um, but plants like oak trees and willows and cherries. Um, trees are really important pollinator habitat. And our native uh, insects really rely and depend upon uh, native trees, especially um, to complete their life cycles. They lay their, cat they lay their eggs on native trees. Uh, caterpillars feed on the foliage of those native trees. Um, 
and uh, the caterpillars then become uh, butterflies or moths um, and complete their life cycles by laying more eggs on those same trees. So it's really important that we think of our, of our gardens as habitat, not just as a beautiful place for us, but also as important habitat for insects and other wildlife. Um, and then finally, this is something that I, I always like to emphasize with folks is that native plants really help to establish a local sense of place. Um, it's always easy when we travel uh, to visit a, you know, a, a highway rest stop or a, a strip mall. Um, you always see the same sort of half a dozen trees and shrubs. Uh, you see the same, you know, fiery red mulch. Uh, and there's just nothing special or unique about those plants that we oftentimes choose for those industrial or, or commercial landscapes. Uh, one way that we can really do better in our backyards and in our gardens is uh, reflecting the, you know, the unique qualities, unique traits of the surrounding area. Um, I lived in the Mid-Atlantic region for 10 years, and I always talk about this when I talk about native plants. When I was down in the Mid-Atlantic, one of the things that I really missed uh, because it felt like home was stone walls running through the forest. That's just, uh, you know, that is New England. I grew up in New England. This is definitely home. Uh, and that's, that's something that you don't see outside of this area. Um, those beautiful stone walls that are, you know, remnants of our, our past agrarian uh, history uh, that just really kind of give you that sense of place, that sense of belonging, that sense that you're in a special place and it's unique. Um, Something else that's really unique about New England is the fall color in this area. And I, I always encourage people to think about, you know, the, obviously fall color brings in a lot of tourists, brings in a lot of tourism dollars. Uh, and what I always say is that um, those tourists are coming to visit our plants, right? They're coming to visit our native plants. Uh, they're coming to visit uh, those fantastic maples, those fantastic oaks, um, all those uh, plants that we admire in the fall with their great fall color, that amazing fall foliage. Uh, people are really coming to visit our plants. That's uniquely New England. That's something that's unique about this area. And we should be doing doing as much as we can to make sure that our gardens reflect the unique character of the region that we're gardening in. And uh, the best way to do that is to use native plants. Um, it can be kind of tricky to figure out what a native plant really is. Uh, there are any number of definitions out there for native plant. And I will say there's no hard, fast, agreed upon definition because this is really a construct of our uh, of our of our minds. Uh, this is not um, uh, nativity is not necessarily something that really exists in the wild. It's just something that we sort of apply uh, to the uh, to the plants and the wildlife around us. Uh, people go to great lengths to define what a native really means. Um, with plants, it's a little bit easier than animals because plants are slower to migrate um, than than animals are. Um, but with with uh, with plants in particular, it's oftentimes difficult for the average person to really know what's meant uh, by a, a native plant. Uh, and so I, I pulled a few definitions uh, from, from the web just to kind of illustrate, you know, the differences and similarities among different definitions for nativity. Uh, and to talk a little bit about how we can use uh, uh, a very simple definition that works no matter where you are in the country, no matter where you are really in the world. Uh, so here's a few. Um, First is that native plants are indigenous to a given area in geologic time. This is from Wikipedia. And so what, what this definition really introduces is the idea that um, uh, uh, ecosystems are not static, uh, that, that plants and animals move around, uh, and that for a prolonged period of time, uh, a, a plant may have evolved in a specific area, uh, and it, it's developed and occurred naturally or existed for many years in that, in that area, and that's something that we would consider native. So what Wikipedia does it, is it introduces this element of time. Um, Next definition down is the National Wildlife Federation, and they immediately jump to defining native plants by uh, the relationships that those plants have with native wildlife. So here you have it, native plants have formed symbiotic relationships with native, native wildlife over thousands of years, and therefore offer the most sustainable habitat. Uh, so leave it to the National Wildlife Federation to define uh, native plants by their relationships with uh, native insects. Uh, but this is another really particularly important point is that native plants, it's important to, to know that you're working with native plants or, it's, or, or native plants are important in supporting local ecosystems, in particular native wildlife. Um, that they occur in a specific region, uh, that they've developed deep 
ecological interactions uh, with native wildlife. Uh, and that's really one of the reasons what, that it's important we understand what, what a native plant is uh, because they're the foundation of all, of all ecosystems in the world. Um, finally, we have a definition from the Kansas Wild Plant Society. Uh, I will say they had about three pages of defining native plant on their website. Um, so I just took a little snippet of, uh, of, of the definition here. Um, and it's, it's very long winded, but I'll, I'll highlight the key sort of important points. Um, uh, their definition in, introduces this idea of human involvement. Uh, so it, it says native plants are those that originated in a given geographic area without human involvement or that arrived there without intentional or unintentional intervention of humans. Um, so what the Kansas Wild Plant Society's definition does is it says, well, maybe time doesn't matter. Maybe those symbiotic relationships with, uh, with animals don't really matter. What's really important is that a native plant is something that migrated there uh, naturally. Um, and we know that this is true for our area. We know that, you know, as, as, as uh, little ago as 12,000 years, we were covered in a sheet of ice above us. And basically all the plants that exist here are those that uh, uh, weathered the storm under the ice or migrated back from, uh, from more southern regions uh, in the past 12,000 years. Um, so those are plants that naturally occurred in this area. You know, humans have really only been in, uh, well, I should say Europeans have really only been in, in uh, the New England area for the past several hundred years. Um, we've brought a lot of plants with us from different parts of the, of the world. Um, some of those plants have become invasive species that are problematic in our, in our area. Uh, many of them are innocuous. Many of them are just great plants like the daffodils that I showed in that earlier image. Um, but native plants are really those that were here before we arrived that migrated here naturally. And that's, that's sort of the, the, the trend uh, that, that native definitions are really taking. Um, what I'd like to do with the next few slides is just show why this can be complicated, why this can be confusing, and then finally offer you the definition that I think is the most appropriate and the one that I tend to use myself uh, for defining native. So this is, um, a range map on the right hand side of the screen, uh, a map of Massachusetts counties uh, sort of in the center to the left of the screen, and then an image of mayapple, uh, Podophyllum peltatum, which is a great native plant in our area uh, on the bottom left hand side of the screen. Um, so according to the Native Plant Trust uh, that publishes GoBotany, which is the online flora of New England, that's where that, uh, that map on the right hand side comes from. Um, the uh, May apple is native in the counties that are colored in green and considered non-native or introduced in the counties that are purple. Now this might be really important for botanists to understand uh, the migration of plants, uh, to understand you know, where plants have been historically, uh, but it's really kind of useless for gardeners. Um, because this, this map shows that May apple uh, is, is native only to, to the Berkshires. So it's native uh, in Berkshire County, Mass. Um, so it's considered introduced or non-native in the rest of the state. Um, that level of detail uh, when we're considering whether something's native or not to an area is, is really too finite. Uh, it's, it's really limiting. Um, and it's appropriate for botanists when they're talking about historic ranges of plants, but it's really not appropriate for gardeners uh, when you're trying to consider whether something is uh, suitable for your neck of the woods and suitable for your garden um, and whether something can be considered native or not. Um, a little coarser, this is uh, Baptisia australis, blue false indigo. Um, and what you're seeing is a map that's taken from the Biota of North America project or BONAP. Um, I include their URL at the very end of the presentation. Um, and so with, uh, with, with this range map, you can see Baptisia, which is a plant that many of us consider native, uh, is really native in the, the highlighted green, the light green counties um, to the center of the country. Uh, so it's native to Oklahoma, um, uh, other states that I just fail to recognize at the moment, um, you know, all those states in the center of the country, uh, it's native there, it's not really native in the Northeast. Um, so this really isn't uh, very close to being native, uh, but if your definition for native for your garden is native to North America or native to the United States, then this plant would be perfectly appropriate. Um, if your definition is a little closer to home, then it's not really gonna fit the bill. Uh, you really wanna look for plants that are naturally found uh, a little bit closer to your backyard. Um, 
Here's another example, and this one's very tricky. This is Tiarella cordifolia. Uh, Tiarella cordifolia is our native foam flower, uh, and you can see from this range map that it's uh, native to really the southeastern United States, and I think some of you uh, listening in this evening are probably saying, well, I, I know that native uh, Tiarella is native to New England. Um, Tiarella actually has two different uh, distinct varieties, botanical varieties. Uh, this is Tiarella cordifolia variety cordifolia. The earlier one is Tiarella cordifolia variety colina. Um, now, both of these are the same species, uh, but they have distinct differences that are not quite enough to make them separate species, but enough that botanists say, well, we can give this one its own separate uh, botanical variety name. In this case, this is Tiarella cordifolia variety cordifolia. Uh, and what's different about these two is that the earlier one, Tiarella cordifolia variety colina, is a clumper. Uh, it doesn't send out runners, so it's not one that forms a dense, uh, a dense sort of vegetative mat uh, like this one does. Tiarella cordifolia variety cordifolia is the running foam flower, um, and it spreads rhizominously. It sends out runners like a strawberry plant would do, um, and so it's a it's a fantastic plant to use as a green mulch. Uh, and you can see from the image that has, it has a much broader geographic range, so it's uh, it's found up into Canada, all throughout New England, uh, really the whole eastern seaboard. Uh, this plant naturally occurs in. So you can see how complex and how confusing this can sometimes get. Um, and so what I like to try to do is offer up a definition uh, that's really fungible, that really works uh, no matter where you are. Um, and, uh, and here it is. So native plants are those that existed in a given region without human introduction. So really simply, you define the region, uh, you define the region that you want to work with. Um, and, you know, look at is this a plant that migrated here naturally? Is it a plant that uh, was brought from uh, a, a large geographic distance away to this area? Um, this is really the best, I think, way to de define what we mean by a native plant um, because it's a definition that's fairly flexible, uh, really can be used for gardeners uh, to suit their own specific purposes, um, and uh, allows you to choose from a wide variety of plants. Um, and it also uh, allows you to, to use plants that have migrated into your area since European settlement. That's one of the silliest things about um, the definitions for native plants that we have uh, that are tied to specific time periods is that it sort of, sort of says, well, uh, if, a, if a plant is native because it was here when European settlers first arrived, then adaptation and evolution and uh, and migration all must have halted at that point. Um, that's sort of a silly way to think about things because adaptation continues to happen. Plants continue to migrate. Our, our climate is certainly warming and it's certainly changing all the time. Um, so it's important that we have a definition uh, that recognizes that uh, those things continue to happen. And so that's what this definition really aims to do. Um, the image that you're seeing here uh, is an artist's interpretation of an EPA map mapping system called the ecoregions. Uh, so these are large geographic areas that share similar uh, climate, similar topography, geology, uh, uh, moisture patterns. Uh, in the case of New England, um, New England states uh, have five separate ecoregions at this level. Uh, the Northeastern Highlands, the Northeastern Coastal Zone, Acadian Plains and Hills, Eastern Great Lakes, and the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens. Um, so when I'm choosing plants for, for my garden or for a garden, I really look to plants that are native to this per, uh, the particular ecoregion that I'm working with. For most of us in southeastern Massachusetts, that's the uh, northeastern coastal zone. If you're down on the Cape, that's the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens. And you can see that the ecoregions extend beyond our political boundaries. Um, so there are plants that may be native to the parts of New York or New Jersey, haven't quite made it into Massachusetts or uh, Connecticut or Rhode Island yet, uh, but I would consider those plants native if I was choosing plants uh, for, for a garden and I wanted to work specifically with natives. So I hope that makes some sense. Um, I hope the definition that I presented is, is easy to use, easy to understand, uh, and something that you can apply in your own, in your own gardening. Um, now what I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit about our uh, site conditions. And the, the, the reason this is important is because I think oftentimes there's a misconception that if I use a native plant, it's going to do well because it's 
naturally found here. Uh, it's naturally suited to um, to this, the particular climate that I'm in, uh, and it's it's going to do well because it's native. And that that really couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, it's always important that we choose plants that are appropriate for the specific site conditions we have in our gardens. So a good example of that is uh, the image here. This is an Asclepius or a milkweed. Um, this one happens to be Asclepius incarnata. Uh, it goes by two common names. One that I like to use a lot is rose milkweed. Uh, it has nice fragrance. It's got kind of a, a flower color that's reminiscent of roses. People generally like roses. Um, so I think that's a, a great name for this plant. The other alternative common name is swamp milkweed. People tend to like swamps less than they like roses. Um, and oftentimes people will shy away from this fantastic native plant that's got great fragrance and is really supportive of uh, monarch butterflies um, because of that common name swamp milkweed. Um, but it's a really fantastic plant. This is a milkweed that does best in really moist soils and will grow in almost standing water, uh, but it also tolerates average garden soils. So it's a plant that will do really do well in a lot of conditions. Um, but contrast this with the butterfly milkweed uh, or orange milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa, which you'll see in a few minutes. Um, that one is a dry loving species. It really wants well-drained soils. It wants to be planted in almost straight sand. Uh, it's found in coastal communities um, and it's not gonna be very happy in a swamp. Um, so as a result, you can't really plant swamp milkweed in a desert and you re really can't plant um, uh, butterfly milkweed in a swamp uh, because they're not gonna be happy both native to our area, but we have to understand the specific site conditions that, uh, that plants really need in order to make sure that they're successful in our garden. Uh, so it's really simple. Understand um, uh, what type of soil you have. Is it well-drained soil? Is it soil that holds onto too much moisture? Does it have a heavy sand content? Does it have a heavy clay content? Uh, what, how much organic matter is, is available? Um, do a soil test. Really understand what your garden soil has to offer. Uh, how much sunlight do you have? Is your garden full sun? Is it part sun? Is it shade? Um, you know, really easy to figure out. I like to use just three breakdowns. So full sun, part sun, or part shade, uh, and then full shade. Um, you know, what are, what, how much sunlight do you have to, do you have to offer in your garden? Uh, and choose plants that are appropriate for those particular conditions. Uh, and then finally, moisture. You know, is this a wet spot in your garden? Um, is this a dry spot in your garden? Is it up on a hill? Uh, is it really well drained? Um, understand what your site conditions are before you start choosing native plants. This is a great example of a plant that's very, very, um, uh, uh, very site specific, uh, but can also be tolerant of a wide range of conditions. Uh, this is bearberry, uh, Arctostaphylos uva ursi. Uh, the one thing that bearberry re really needs is well-drained soil. It will not be happy if it's standing in any kind of moisture at all. It will not be happy if the soil holds on to too much moisture. Um, it's very tolerant of full sun, very tolerant of salt, uh, in the landscape. It's a coastal species that's very tolerant of those conditions. Um, it's incredibly cold hardy. It's also very heat tolerant. Um, so it has a broad range of uh, cultural conditions that it can tolerate, but the one thing that it can't tolerate is wet feet. Uh, and we saw this last winter. We got, I think, about 11 inches of rain in Boylston in November. Um, and as a result, we lost a lot of bearberry um, because the soil was just sopping wet going into, into the winter, uh, it literally just rotted right in the soil. Um, so it's just an example of, you know, choosing your site, uh, choosing a plant based on your site conditions uh, and that being a really important consideration. Um, and then finally, make sure you have enough space for the plants that you're choosing. Um, you know, plants have a, an ultimate height uh, that they may get, get to. Don't be the guy that plants an oak tree under the power lines uh, because 20 or 30 years later, this is what you're looking at. Uh, and this goes for um, perennials, this goes for shrubs, this goes for trees. It's really important that we choose plants that, uh, that are the appropriate size for the particular corner of our garden that we're trying to put them in, uh, not trying to fit an oak tree under the power lines. Uh, and then finally, the last little bit under choosing the right plant that I wanted to talk about is systemic insecticides. I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, the plight of pollinators um, and all the different reasons that we're losing 
bees and butterflies and, and really important insects. Uh, one of the key culprits in our gardens that we have a lot of control over uh, is systemic insecticides uh, in particular. So systemic insecticides are sold uh, to the average homeowner under a lot of different trade names. Uh, this is Bayer Advanced Science. Uh, it's sold um, uh, in any most hardware stores. Uh, it's it's uh, imidacloprid, which is the active ingredient. And it's a very effective chemical for, um, for killing a number of different insects that feed on uh, trees and shrubs in our landscapes. Uh, it's also a very effective uh, chemical at killing pollinators. Um, so it's important that we recognize that systemic insecticides are very long lasting and very mobile in our environments. They make the entire plant toxic, including nectar, including pollen. Um, they are absorbed into a plant's vascular system, making that entire plant, every single cell in that plant um, uh, toxic. And when you're, when you're shopping at garden centers and nurseries, you should really be asking for uh, plants that are free of systemic pesticides, free of neonics. Uh, that's another uh, sort of common moniker that they go by. Uh, neonics refers to neonicotinoids, which is the class of pesticide that imidacloprid and other uh, systemic insecticides are. These are really effective uh, for um, killing uh, pest insects, but they're also really effective and really damaging in our environment. And it's, it's, it's time we started treating them that way. There was a, an effort um, to, to implement a partial ban on uh, systemic insecticides, neonics in particular, in Massachusetts uh, the last couple of years. It's failed every single time, unfortunately, um, but hopefully that will happen at some point. Connecticut has passed uh, pretty tight restrictions on uh, neonics and other systemic insecticides, uh, as has Maryland. Um, and unfortunately, Mar Massachusetts just hasn't done so yet, uh, but I hope that that will happen in the near future. All right, having said all of that, it's time to look at some uh, great images of plants and talk about some of my favorite native plants for the landscape. Um, so first is uh, the Acteas. Uh, here are a few of them. These are actually three different species. On the left, you see uh, a plant that's called doll's eyes. That's Actea pachypoda. Um, it is a, a spring bloomer. Um, so the flowers come up relatively early in the spring. Um, and uh, they're followed by this really long lasting persistent fruit display. Uh, it has this creepy sort of eerie effect of following, following you around in the garden um, because of that, that little dot on the end of the fruit that looks like an eyeball. Um, so it's a little bit like Mona Lisa following you as you walk through the garden, but just a great and persistent long lasting fruit display. Uh, oftentimes into July, uh, you'll still have fruit on, on doll's eyes. Um, in the middle, we have a, a more of a flowering Actea. This is Actea race mosa. Uh, used to be called simisifuga, so you might still see it listed as simisifuga. Uh, it's black cohosh. Black cohosh is the common name. Um, and this is a great plant. It sort of acts like a, like a shrub that disappears at the end of the season. Uh, it gets very tall. These flower spikes come up in June. Uh, I've seen them seven, eight feet tall, depending on the site conditions. Um, the plant itself is sort of a mounding perennial, clumping mounding perennial. Um, all of these really do uh, best in the shade garden. They're certainly not going to tolerate a whole lot of sun uh, and they really like moist fertile soils. Uh, but they'll tolerate a lot of uh, 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 quite a vari variation of soil conditions, uh, especially Actea race, most of the one in the middle there. Um, great pollinator attractant. Uh, you can see the flowers toward the bottom uh, of that spike are open. The ones toward the top are still developing. So it flowers for a long period of time. Uh, just puts on a great display uh, in sort of early to mid summer. Um, and then the foliage is, uh, is, has nice color to it, very coarse. Um, and as I mentioned, before, it's a very large and robust plant. So it sort of acts like a shrub in the garden um, during the summer and then dies back to the ground. These are all perennials, uh, so there won't be any evidence of them above ground for the winter, um, but they'll come back year after year after year. And then on the right, we have Actea rubra, uh, the red, red baneberry. This is another of what we consider the uh, the fruiting baneberries, are, uh, and it's got this really brilliant red, shiny, almost waxy um, fruit, and just, again, long-lasting, persistent fruit display. Um, so with the Acteas, you get early spring flowers, midsummer flowers. Uh, there are a couple of other species that bloom after Actea race mosa that I don't mention tonight, um, but, uh, but you, can, you can find them pretty easily. Actea um, um, uh, podocarpa is one, uh, as, uh, as, as is uh, the maple leaf Actea, which is uh, Actea um, uh, rubifolia. Uh, 
and Actea rubifolia blooms kind of July, uh, and that's a fantastic one. Great, great foliage on it. Um, neither of those are native to New England. They're, they're native a little bit farther south, but they're also, uh, they're both really great plants. Uh, this one we saw before, this is Asclepius incarnata, the rose milkweed. And as I mentioned, rose milkweed really wants to be grown in wet soils, although it will to tolerate sort of average garden soils with plenty of organic matter. Um, has that, uh, that brilliant rose colored flower. Uh, Asclepius in general just have such great structure to the flower. They're quite small, they flower in these clusters, uh, but they're just so interesting to look at. Uh, I, I always love getting in and kind of admiring the flowers themselves. Um, and as I mentioned before, rose milkweed, uh, as other milkweeds, is the host plant, the only host plant um, for the monarch caterpillar. So if you're interested in, in attracting monarch butterflies to your garden, the best way to do that is to give them a place to lay eggs. Um, I have a bunch of uh, common milkweed in my garden. That's uh, not something I planted. It's just something that, that occurs here naturally. Uh, and it was about three or four years ago, I was sitting out on my back deck with my, my two boys who were at the time probably 10 and seven. Um, and we were just watching this monarch butterfly fly around the back deck and realizing that it, it, uh, she was laying eggs all over the place uh, on the milkweed that I, had, uh, that I had growing everywhere. And so that summer we got to raise uh, a generation of monarch caterpillars. And it was a really fantastic teaching tool for my kids. Uh, it was really great for them to see these tiny little caterpillars grow up uh, to be big giant caterpillars and then pupate and turn into, turn into butterflies. Uh, and the only reason that we had those monarchs in our garden was because we were growing uh, milkweed kind of accidentally, but uh, growing milkweed nonetheless. So if you'd like to see that, if you'd like to have that uh, life cycle um, take place in your garden, you really need to make sure that you have the host plant um, to accommodate them. So uh, plants and milkweed attract monarch caterpillars or monarch butterflies to lay eggs so that you'll have caterpillars and enjoy that, uh, that really important um, habitat in your backyard. Uh, this is the other milkweed that I mentioned earlier. This is butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. Uh, it, I did uh, talk a, quite a bit about the caterpillars, monarch caterpillars feeding on it. Um, both of these plants are also really important for uh, larger pollinators and butterflies, bees uh, visit them prolifically. They're just fantastic um, uh, nectar sources. So definitely visited by a lot of different insects in the garden, a lot of beautiful insects in the garden. Um, Asclepius tuberosa has pretty great fall color. Um, what I like about tuberosa, it's, it's got the best foliage, I think, of all of the Asclepius. It's also a, a fairly well-behaved mounding perennial, unlike some of the other Asclepius. Common milkweed is not one that I would recommend most people grow in their gardens. Um, and this is one that I would allow to seed around all over the place. It uh, has these great milkweed pods um, and the, the seeds blow around everywhere like uh, all other milkweeds do. Um, and they're just uh, they're fantastically beautiful. I love those seed pods. I love it when the when the seeds emerge and start flying around the garden. Um, so they have a uh, the milkweeds in general are are great native plants to include in the garden. Uh, Asclepius tuberosa, if you've got the right conditions for it, is a, is a fantastically beautiful plant. One I would really recommend. Shifting gears a bit, this is a wild bleeding heart, Dicentra eximia. Um, I uh, remember my mom having uh, the European bleeding heart uh, growing in her in her garden when I was a kid. It was always a little finicky. Uh, did well for a couple of years, but then it sort of petered out. Um, she never. She always kind of struggled with it. Um, so I always thought of bleeding hearts as as these kind of delicate, finicky difficult to grow plants. And then I came across Dicentria eximia um, and I saw it growing out of this crevice in this granite outcrop. Um, and I was amazed at how well it did. I was also amazed that it was blooming still in like August. Uh, this is a plant that does really well in kind of the worst of conditions, tolerates drought, tolerates full sun, also tolerates some shade. Uh, and it's kind of bulletproof. Uh, I love this plant. It's a great pollinator attractant blooms from spring into summer uh, and you know gives you that unique shape of bleeding heart that you've come come to expect uh, but it's a lot more tolerant of um, poor conditions than i would expect a bleeding heart to be and as i mentioned it can bloom for a really long time um, this one this picture was taken actually in uh, late july early august on a plant that had been blooming for quite a while at that point um, I think one of the most important things we can do in our garden is stop thinking about <coughs> covering the ground in mulch. Uh, 
and start thinking about covering the ground uh, in green plant material. And one of the best ways to do that is uh, with a plant like this one. This is Fregaria virginiana, the wild strawberry. This happens to be a garden in the woods, which is a garden that I used to work at. Uh, and this was a, an area that was sort of left, uh, this was an area that didn't really have a whole lot going on. It was sort of a mulch desert when I first arrived at Garden in the Woods. Um, and we transplanted some wild strawberry around some fruit trees that we had moved into the area. Uh, and within about two years time, they had completely taken over the whole area and turned into this pretty incredibly beautiful uh, lawn. Uh, we had an annual event in the middle of June every year. Um, and we would uh, typically uh, let all the uh, attendees for the event just walk through the wild strawberry and pick fruit uh, as, the, as they were enjoying some beer and wine uh, and some live music. Um, and people didn't seem to mind walking through about six or eight inches of wild strawberries because that fruit reward was so great. Um, wild strawberries do have uh, amazing fruits. They're one of the parent plants for the, uh, the common garden strawberry. Uh, the fruit's very small, but it's incredibly packed uh, with sugar. And uh, these strawberries are long lived need very little care from us. Uh, great flowers in the spring, followed by these very tasty fruits um, in mid-June. Amazing fall color. Um, with this particular area, we mowed it once uh, a year, sometimes once every other year, just to kind of neaten it up a little bit. We did that right after it was finished flowering. Um, this is a plant that tolerates full sun, dry exposed soils. I have it growing on a granite outcrop in my backyard and it's done extremely well there. We always get a ton of fruit on it. Um, it's a pretty dense plant. Uh, it definitely is um, very effective at keeping weeds down, keeping other weeds that you might not want down. And it's, it's you know, if we're honest with ourselves about what we're looking for out of a lawn, uh, this is a fantastic lawn alternative. It's, a, it's an evergreen uh, mat forming perennial uh, that really gives you that sort of green carpet that you're looking for out of a lawn. Certainly not something that you can play soccer on, uh, but it's definitely tolerant of foot traffic. So it's a, it's, a, it's a plant that you can walk all over, your dog can roll around it on top of, uh, and you can enjoy the fruits of your labor in the middle of June when it starts to fruit. Uh, this is a plant that just started blooming in the garden uh, uh, this year. This is Mertensia virginica, Virginia bluebells. Um, you can see it's got that fantastic blue color. Um, it, there, there also is um, a white variant, so occasionally Virginia bluebells will bloom white. Uh, this is a true spring ephemeral, so it's a plant that will come up very, very early in the spring. Uh, it'll bloom that fantastic show of blue. The, color, the flowers will fade to sort of a pinkish before they, uh, before they set seed, uh, and then they'll go dormant. Um, they have this, uh, this nice light colored green foliage that's really striking in the early part of the season. Um, definitely a plant that does best in some shade, in a shadier area at least. It's in full sun uh, because the, the trees haven't leafed out yet by the time it, uh, it's done in the spring um, because it's, so, it's, it's life cycle is so rapid. Uh, but it's a, I love any blue flower. I can get my hands on and this is definitely one that's uh, one of the earliest in the in the season and one that I really admire just absolutely love uh, it works very well naturalized with other spring wildflowers you can see it here in this image with um, some uh, uh, white trillium in the background with some wood poppy uh, that yellow flower uh, and also a little bit of maidenhair fern, fern and some other ferns in the background as well um, just a, a fantastic plant um, can once it's established it'll spread itself around all through your garden. Uh, absolutely let it do that. Just let it run, run wild. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing plant. And, and then it's dormant by the time uh, we get to you know, middle to end of May um, and, and you won't see it again until the following season. A um, couple of phlox that I'd like to talk about. So phlox de vericata is our native wild blue phlox. And you can see it here actually planted in combination with another phlox species that's not quite native to our area, native a little bit farther south, um, phlox stolonifera. They're sort of indistinguishable in this, in this image because they are planted together. Um, both of them offer uh, fantastic blue flowers, typically around Mother's Day. They also bloom in pink and white. Uh, these are shade tolerant species. They're ones that really wanna grow in a rich sort of woodland garden environment. Um, 
uh, wild blue phlox, the phlox divericata, which is our, our native species, uh, also is quite fragrant. Just a powerful fragrance in the spring when it's in full bloom. Uh, works great in combination with uh, foam flower. You can see that in the image on the right hand side over there. Um, and because uh, both of these are mat forming perennials, um, they work really well as a living mulch, uh, like I was mentioning before with the Frigaria. Um, but the, these happen to work well as a living mulch in more of a shady environment. Uh, so here are just a couple of more images of that wild blue phlox. <clears throat> Uh, this is this is phlox uh, buds before they've opened, so you can see what that uh, what the foliage looks like, what the flower looks like. Um, oftentimes, when we're working with volunteers in the garden, uh, they sometimes tend to to weed out the phlox because it looks a little bit like chickweed. Uh, so it's important that you recognize what plant you're actually weeding before you start to do so. Uh, and it can, when it's uh, in the early sort of stages in the early spring, um, definitely look like some of our weedy species. So it's, uh, it's important that you remember um, uh, what it is, where it's planted, that you're not weeding it out. We saw this one early on. This is uh, Podophyllum peltatum, the may apple. Um, may apple is in the barberry family. So the entire plant is toxic. Um, but the fruit is edible. So once the fruit is ripe, it's edible. Um, it's actually eaten by box turtles and box turtles uh, digest it, um, carry that seed and that's how it's distributed. That's how this plant is really uh, moved from uh, one part of the world to another uh, naturally. So you can understand that it's a very slow migration. Um, May apple is another spring ephemeral, um, comes up very, very early in the season, um, does its thing, flowers under the foliage. It's important to think about this one, uh, you know, maybe sighting it on a hill where you can admire the flower from a little bit lower down. Um, otherwise, you really have to lift the foliage up in order to see the flower. Um, it does have that, that nice sort of umbrella shape to the leaf, uh, will occupy a lot of space very, very early in the season, and then it's dormant uh, by the time we get to summer. So this is really a, another true spring ephemeral. Um, the fruit is edible. Uh, full disclosure, I've never eaten it, but I understand that it's edible. Um, uh, but as I mentioned, the box turtles really love to eat this one, uh, and they're the, the, the primary distributors of it. Uh, this is a, a plant that blooms in sort of midsummer, so early to midsummer. This is Pycnanthum muticum, broadleaf mountain mint. I have a lot of this planted at, at the um, uh, edge of my driveway at home. Um, and the reason I have it planted there is because it's a tremendous pollinator attractant. Uh, it's a great mat forming perennial. It is a true mint and it has a square stem and it smells very minty. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, this one in particular has uh, these sort of white, almost powdery bracts. So those, uh, those leaves that you see toward the tips of the stems um, are, are part of the floral structure. They're, they're covered in this sort of white indumentum. Um, and the flower itself are, are born in these little clusters. You can see the tiny individual flowers. When this thing's in bloom, it's absolutely covered in insects, uh, and pollinating insects. So bees, uh, you know, dozens of species of bees, lots of wasps, including this fantastic wasp called the great blue wasp. Uh, that's like an inch and a half long, very threatening, but uh, you can almost pet it while it's, uh, while it's moving around on Pycnanthemum because it just doesn't care anything about what you're doing. It's just in, uh, mountain mint heaven, uh, really enjoying the nectar uh, and collecting nectar as it's as it's going. Uh, it's a it's a great plant for pollinators. Um, it's also one that just provides nice texture in the garden, a little splash of color uh, with those bracts and the and the very interesting flowers, uh, and one that I really like a lot. It does tend to be kind of aggressive. Um, I recommend planting it in a spot where you really don't care about anything else growing, um, and I also recommend planting it in a spot where it doesn't get a ton of moisture because it'll be a lot tamer uh, in a spot that's a little bit drier. One of my favorite shrubs is this little guy. This is three-tooth syncofoil, Sebaldiopsis tridentata. Uh, it's got this amazing glossy evergreen foliage. Uh, turns kind of a nice purplish in the, in the fall and then holds that color straight through the winter. Um, it's tough as nails. You can see it here growing in this little crack of a, of a granite outcrop. Uh, it's in the rose family. So the app, I mean, the flower might look familiar to you. It looks a little bit like an apple blossom. Um, blooms around the same time. So sometime uh, soon, maybe in, uh, in later April into May, it'll start to flower. Um, 
it is evergreen, as I mentioned, and it is a shrub. It's got woody stems, doesn't get more than maybe three or four inches tall, um, but it's a dense mat of ground cover. Uh, it does best in um, dry sort of sandy soils um, and wants baking full sun and very salt tolerant. Where I have it planted at home, it's at the edge of, or the top of my driveway where it just gets buried in snow all winter, um, covered in a, in a lot of uh, salt spray from, from the plows, uh, and it doesn't skip a beat. Uh, as soon as the snow melts, there it is. Great purple color. Uh, you can see some of that purple color here. Um, here it is planted with Phlox subulata, uh, which is our native moss phlox, um, also getting ready to bloom. Um, so this is kind of an early spring shot before the Sibaldiopsis has, uh, has turned green again for the season. It does have a nice glossy evergreen um, uh, foliage for the, uh, for the summer months, and then turns this kind of uh, brilliant purple color for the fall and winter. Mentioned this one a few times. This is Tiarella cordifolia, our native foam flower. Uh, I love this one for its uh, its flower, uh, which is kind of fleeting. I also really love it for its foliage. Um, so here are a couple of examples of foliage of foam flower. On the left hand side, you see a cultivar, and I've forgotten now uh, what cultivar that is. On the right hand side, you just see a, a natural species of Tiarella cordifolia. It has great character, uh, great sort of variability in its uh, in the foliage texture. In fact, the six images that you see here, I took uh, these images at Garden in the Woods um, on uh, six different plants that were all grown from the same seed source. Uh, so each of these had the same basic genetic material in them, um, but you can see how much variability there was in the, in the foliage uh, from you know, really deep sinuses to entire foliage uh, without any uh, kind of lobes at all modeling, that modeling that you see, this was pretty early in the season, that modeling gets more and more pronounced. Um, so that kind of purple coloration in the middle of uh, a couple of the leaves, the, the purple sort of spots on that leaf in the bottom right hand corner, uh, all that character just gets more and more pronounced um, throughout the season. Uh, it's really beautiful. And you know, we don't oftentimes appreciate foam flower enough for its foliage character, but it's got really great foliage that lasts uh, through, throughout the summer months uh, and really gives us a, a, a great carpet of green um, for most of the most of the growing season. A uh, couple of shrubs to talk about. So this is Hemimalis virginiana, our native witch hazel. Our native witch hazel blooms in the fall. So uh, these flowers you can see were take. Uh, this picture was probably taken sometime around Thanksgiving. Um, there is also a native uh, North American species of witch hazel called Hemimalis vernalis. That's native. It's it's actually called the Ozark witch hazel. So it's native more to the southeast, um, and that one blooms in spring. Uh, Vernalis makes sense that it would bloom in spring. Uh, that one is is really just finishing up flowering now, so it blooms in February, March in our area. There are plenty of hybrids, uh, and there are some Asian species as well, like Hemimalis mollis. Uh, Hemimalis intermedia is a hybrid, uh, pretty common cultivar, as uh, Arnold's Promise that you may have uh, heard about or have in your own garden. Um, but Hemimalis virginiana, unlike a lot of the other witch hazels that are available, uh, does bloom in the fall, has amazing fall color. It's a fairly large shrub. This one I've seen, you know, 12, 15 feet tall, uh, multi-stemmed, um, great flowers. Sometimes the flower is obscured by the fall color. The leaf tends to have the same color as those flower petals. Uh, but when the timing's right, uh, the flowers are there after the foliage has fallen and you get this great floral display. Uh, witch hazel is really beautiful. And one of those things that doesn't overwhelm you with color, uh, but it's a really nice subtle, uh, subtle uh, sort of accent in the garden. Hydrangea arborescens, the smooth hydrangea. This one is native a little bit farther south of us, so it doesn't quite get into New England, um, but it's the, it's, the, it's the closest thing that we really get to a native hydrangea, so I wanted to mention it. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the uh, natural form of the flower. So each one of those uh, individual little dots is a, is a fertile flower. Um, you can see it has one flower with a showy large petal, um, and that flower petal, or that flower in particular, is actually infertile. It doesn't have any uh, sexual parts, so it's got no pollen, no nectar, doesn't really offer anything for, uh, for pollinating insects. Um, but the, uh, the picture on the right, what you're seeing is actually the flower for the Annabelle hydrangea, which is a cultivar of hydrangea arborescens. Uh, and this is where it gets important that we understand um, 
the, the, uh, when we're selecting cultivars for our gardens, it's always important that we do a little digging, a little, little research on them. Um, Annabelle hydrangea is a fantastic plant. It's got great color, uh, great, great flowers, um, blooms in mid to late summer. Um, what, one thing that's nice about hydrangea arborescence is that you can cut it back to the ground every year. Because it blooms on new wood, you won't cut off next year's flowers. Um, and uh, the flowers are really long lasting. You can dry them. Uh, they make, you know, they, they work really well in dried floral arrangements. But the Annabelle hydrangea, the one on the right there, the one that you most commonly see available, um, doesn't offer any pollen or any nectar. So I always encourage people to look for the natural species as opposed to Annabelle. Uh, if they're interested in attracting pollinators, pollinators to their garden, uh, it's really important that you have a food source for them. And so in this case, hydrangea arborescens, go for the natural species, um, go for a plant that actually has pollen and nectar um, in its flowers so that you can attract and support those pollinators in your garden. Uh, this is one that we posted on our Instagram page recently and people were really uh, taken by it. This is Calmia latifolia, our native mountain laurel. On the left hand side you can see what the flowers look like. Um, flowers come in a range of colors. Uh, there's been a lot of work done to select uh, interesting um, flower colors so there are a lot of cultivars that are available in the market. They're all Calmia latifolia uh, but they just happen to be, uh, uh, they happen to have a lot of um, variability in their floral character. So you can see, you know, there are pinks and reds and whites and all sorts of different striping, um, just a, a lot of different flowers that are available out there. Uh, naturally, most mountain laurels will bloom white. Oftentimes you'll get pink, uh, sort of a light pale pink, but this is what the flower looks like. It's just got a, a really fantastic uh, uh, shape to it. Really interesting. Um, mountain laurel is usually billed as an evergreen, um, uh, something that you might use as a foundation plant in front of your house. It doesn't really work uh, in that circumstance. I, I always say um, people will be disappointed by this plant. We should really temper our expectations for how evergreen it is. Um, but in the image on the right, you can see how gorgeous this plant can be uh, when we just allow it to, uh, to grow to its natural form and its natural shape. It wants to be a very tall sort of lanky shrub with foliage and flowers towards the, toward the tips, but it's got this amazing sculptural quality. Uh, that really dark stem covered in some snow after a light snow in the middle of winter can be really beautiful. Um, but this is not a plant that's going to work well as an evergreen screen, uh, but it is definitely a plant that will give you a, an amazing sculptural quality in the landscape and some, some great flowers uh, in the middle of uh, June, July. Um, another fantastic shrub that I love a lot that's actually in flower right now, I could have taken the image on the left uh, today, uh, is Lindera benzoin, our native spice bush. Um, this is one uh, that has uh, great fragrance. I always, when I, whenever I come across this one, I always break off a twig, scrape the bark off, and just uh, take a nice big whiff because it's a, just a, a great smell. Um, and in fact, you can clip off a bunch of those twigs and put them, steep them in some hot water, and it makes a really tasty tea. Um, but it's also a great pollinator plant. Uh, it's the, the, uh, one of the primary host plants for the spicebush swallowtail, which is a, a beautiful little native butterfly in our area. Um, it's, uh, it's a shrub that's dioecious. What that means is there are separate male and female plants. Um, and the females have fruit, so they bear fruit like the image that you see here. This great red fruit, red coloration is fantastic on it. Um, but the males do not. And so if you're interested in fruit, you've got to make sure that you have at least a female. Uh, and if you're not sure that you have spice bush in your area, you want to make sure that you plant both a male and a female so that you can get good, uh, good pollination and good fruit set. Um, good fall color on spicebush. This is definitely a plant that wants to grow in quite a bit of moisture, um, but it will also take average garden soils. Uh, so I wouldn't plant it in a dry area, uh, but it'll definitely take, you know, most average garden soils and be happiest with uh, a little bit of extra moisture. Um, so one to plant, you know, uh, in, a, in a wet spot in your garden. Um, great sort of dark stems. Um, the flowers that you see on the left-hand side uh, are, um, uh, open quite early in the season, uh, but the, the flower buds are set in the fall and they sort of sit and hang out there all winter long and they're, they're quite striking in their own right. Another one of our big tall native shrubs is Rhododendron Maximum, the Great Rose Bay. Uh, you can see it here. This is oftentimes sold as a foundation plant as well, but it wants to be 20 feet tall. 
And I really encourage people to allow it to get to that height. Uh, this is a stand that uh, we had limbed up um, uh, to about six or eight feet um, so that you could really appreciate that architectural quality of the stem. Um, flowers in, in June, those, uh, those great purple flowers. This is a native, uh, native shrub. Most people don't recognize that. Um, Michael Durr uh, says in his book that uh, every garden should have at least one viburnum, so I'm giving you three. Uh, on the left-hand side is a, a more northern species called hobblebush, viburnum lantanoides. Um, fantastic spring flowers followed by some great fruit, um, good fall color, one that really wants to be in a cold climate. Uh, not always happy, um, depending on where you are in Massachusetts, not always happy. Uh, wants to be planted on a, on a bank and just allowed to kind of scra scrabble down the hillside. Definitely seen it on Mount Wachusett and it's really happy there. Um, but in Southern Massachusetts or uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, it's not gonna be as happy as it would be in more Northern areas. Um, in the middle is Viburnum nudum, variety nudum. Uh, the wither rod, this one has amazing fall color, great glossy green foliage, um, a, a beautiful fruit set, uh, wants moister soils and gets quite large, eight to ten feet tall. And then on the right hand side is, uh, is a tiny little shrub that you'll see growing in an in a oak uh, sort of understory and that's Viburnum acerifolium. Um, great fall color, uh, just amazing fall color on a shrub that doesn't get much more than about three or four feet tall. Very tolerant of dry uh, soil conditions. Um, just a few more plants to get through. This is Carex pensylvanica, which I think is probably the best lawn alternative that we have, especially for, uh, for shady uh, sort of dry sites. Um, this is Pennsylvania sedge. Um, and this is a, a small lawn that was planted, uh, again, at Garden in the Woods. This lawn was mowed once a year um, in the middle of June, just to kind of clean it up a little bit. This is not a true grass. It's a, it's a sedge, so it's a graminoid, but it's not a true grass. Uh, it's a native woodland understory plant um, and given the right conditions it'll definitely take off and form a dense mat like this one that you see here never needs to be fertilized never needs to be irrigated uh, and you really only have to mow it if you want to once a year just to kind of keep it neat and tidy um, does bloom in the spring it's getting ready to flower pretty soon you can see the flower on the right uh, and then a couple of ferns to round us off. So this is maidenhair fern, Adiantum pedatum. Despite its appearance, this fern is really tough as nails. Um, does best in more alkaline soils, uh, but will tolerate, you know, the typical sort of acid New England soils that we have in most of our backyard gardens. Um, wants some shade, uh, but, uh, but is a really fantastic plant once it's established. You can see that the black rachis, which is that, that stem in the middle there, uh, is really striking. Um, like like all ferns, uh, maidenhair fern has a fiddlehead. It's always important to understand that not every fiddlehead is edible. In fact, most of them are not. Uh, this is the fiddlehead for maidenhair fern. This is not an edible fiddlehead. Uh, every fern has a fiddlehead. This is just how they grow. They're, that leaf unfurls that turns into that little fiddlehead uh, as it unfurls and then it expands and turns into the full, full uh, fern frond. Um, if you're interested in the edible, um, fiddlehead, we only have one in our area and it's Matusia struthiopterus, the fiddlehead fern, uh, also called ostrich fern. This is it here. This is a very aggressive plant, gets about uh, four to six feet tall. Those fronds are just huge. Um, it does have, uh, you can see on the left hand side at the bottom, those are the edible fiddleheads as they're coming up. It's always important that you understand uh, which fern you're eating so that you make sure you've, you've got the right one, that you're not going to get sick. Um, uh, fiddlehead also has this amazing fertile frond that comes up. Um, so the fronds that you saw in this previous image, they don't have any spores on them. So they don't have the, uh, the sexual structures that allow, uh, fiddle, that allow ferns to make more ferns. Um, those are only found on these fertile fronds uh, that are sort of uh, much tougher, uh, much smaller, only get about eight to 12 inches tall. Um, and then they're long lasting, they're persistent. You can see the, the ones on the right are, are fresh ones that have um, just recently recently unfurled. The one on the left um, is one that is a shot that was taken in the middle of winter. Uh, so you can see they sort of harden and almost turn woody uh, and then they form this really nice delicate sort of uh, uh, sculptural piece in the landscape that's uh, that's really uh, really quite striking uh, especially when it's surrounded by a little bit of snow cover. Um, Last fern is Phagopterus connectilis, the long beach fern. I mentioned a couple of spring ephemerals early on in the talk. Uh, 
Uh, this is a fern that works really well in combination with spring ephemerals. The reason I say that is because it, it emerges pretty late in the season, so it allows those uh, spring ephemerals to do their thing. They come up, they flower, they set seed, they go dormant, and then Phagopterus comes up and, and helps to occupy the space that was, uh, that was held by those spring ephemerals. So it's a nice kind of time-sharing uh, uh, sequence with this plant. This is a, a nice mat-forming perennial um, fern. It's got really interesting interesting attachment. The frond sort of comes up and then makes uh, almost a right angle. Uh, so it lays uh, about six inches above the soil, uh, lays kind of flat. So it has a really interesting, it's hard to see that in this image, uh, really interesting attachment uh, with the frond. But a, a beautiful little plant, great ground cover, uh, and really nice in combination with spring ephemerals. I did mention that I was going to uh, give you the URL for the Biota of North America program. If you ever want to, you know, see if a plant is native to your area, this is a pretty easy way to do it. Uh, on the left-hand side, there's a, a link that says list plants by genera. Hopefully you can see I'm kind of highlighting it here with my cursor. Uh, if, you, if you select that, um, it will allow you to search for plants by their, uh, by their genus. You can also search for plants by, uh, by their family name. Um, and so if you know the Latin name of the plant that you're looking for, uh, you can create maps like this one. So this is a map for the Long Beach fern that we just looked at. Um, and what it's showing you is that it's, got, it's a pretty broad ranging fern. Uh, it's native to more Northern states. You know, it's in Michigan, it's in Wisconsin. Uh, it's all throughout New England up into Maine. Uh, those light green counties are places where it was historically documented as, uh, as present. Um, so this is a, a, a great way to see if, if a plant is actually native to your area or not. Uh, fantastic way to, to do that through uh, some pretty uh, intuitive maps. Um, with that, I hope you enjoyed this evening's lecture. Uh, I did mention early on that I published a book a couple of years ago with a colleague, Dan Jaffe, who uh, contributed most of the photos in tonight's lecture. Uh, it's, uh, I like it. I think it's a great book. It's got more than 100 uh, fantastic native plants in it. Um, so if you like what you heard tonight and you'd like to learn a little bit more about native species, I definitely, rec definitely recommend you look out for this book. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. It looks like a, a few of you, um, I think, maybe contributed some questions through the chat. So I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, I am going to stop sharing my screen and then uh, unmute all of you. So if you'd like to ask a question um, verbally, you can do that as well. Uh, but let me see if I can look through the chats here. Um, so I'm just going to answer a couple of these and then I'll open it up to some other questions. Uh, so one question was about uh, systemic insecticides. Someone asked how long Neonex last once applied. Um, and so that's a pretty long answer. Uh, what I'll say about that is that uh, there have been no studies to show um, how long Neonex uh, 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 are active in a plant. Um, I will say there was a, a research paper that I read a few years ago um, that looked at hemlocks that had been treated with woolly adelgia to help prevent um, uh, uh, hemlock, or sorry, hemlocks that had been treated with imidacloprid um, to, uh, to help prevent uh, damage from woolly adelgia. Um, and they were still finding de detectable uh, uh, amounts of imidacloprid seven years after a single treatment. Um, so these things can be very long lasting. Now that's only one study. Um, but I will say if you're growing, uh, if you're buying perennials or if you're buying shrubs, uh, you certainly don't want to buy a plant that's been treated uh, within the last year. Um, so a plant that's been treated that growing season or perhaps the growing season beforehand, uh, you should really try to avoid. Uh, we don't really understand how persistent these uh, these oh, yes, are in our environments, um, so it's it's really important that we just avoid them at all costs. Um, someone asked if Amsonia, uh, so Amsonia, which goes by the common name Blue Star, uh, if that's a native plant. Um, so that one is a, a plant that's native a little bit farther south. It's more of a southeastern uh, native species. That if you're interested, you could search for it through Bonap. That Bonap. Bonap.org website that I gave you. 
you look for Amsonia, um, you'll, you'll uh, find it and you can see what the native range is. There's a few different species of Amsonia. Uh, the one that I'm uh, most fond of is Amsonia hubrichtii, the Hubrix blue star. Uh, and that one is, as I mentioned, it's native a little bit farther south, probably gets up into, you know, maybe as close as, uh, as Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, more of a mid-Atlantic uh, sort of uh, peak to its range. Um, another question here, is are most of these plants available at our local nurseries? Uh, yeah, 100% of the plants that I talked about this evening you can find at local nurseries. Uh, they're all very common plants. In fact, um, most nurseries sell native plants without talking about them as being native plants. Uh, there are a lot of fantastic native plants out there to choose from. We don't always recognize that, uh, that they're native species. Um, Someone else is asking, what's the best local source for the plants I talked about? Uh, a great nursery. Um, I would say just go to your favorite local nursery um, and, and look for some of the species that we talked about this evening. Um, I would hate to highlight one specific nursery, um, but there, there are a ton of great nurseries and great garden centers out there uh, that sell native plants. Um, you can find most of the plants that I talked about this evening. Uh, with a little bit of digging, you'll find them um, pretty easily. Um, but most of these are fairly common and fairly easy to find. Um, so rather than give you one recommendation, I would say that most of the plants that I talked about tonight are, are fairly easy to come by, uh, very commonly available native plants. Um, so those were great. I, I appreciate all those questions. Does anyone have a question they'd like to, uh, to ask? <laughs> Someone was a little loud, so I had to mute them. Um, I don't think they were asking you a question. Does anyone, anyone have a question? Um, I do. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering about possible alternatives to the um, neonics. I have a lot of ticks in my area. I just recently moved to the area, so we've been battling ticks for... Sorry. Sorry. No problem. No problem. I have a two-year-old, I get it. <laughs> She's one. Yeah. <laughs> way past her bedtime. Uh, so I recently, um, I've been doing tick tubes and, and trying to find ways to battle ticks long-term, but um, now having a baby that's just starting to walk, um, I can, like, I can go out onto my driveway and find ticks in the driveway. They're sure. across the yard, so... Yeah, so so ticks come up pretty often. Um, a couple things. So neonics aren't effective against ticks. Uh, yeah. In fact, um, the uh, w another study that I uh, read a couple of years ago was looking at um, what happens to uh, American elms that are treated with uh, uh, imidacloprid to um, as a preventative for uh, I forget what they were, I forget what insect they were attacking it might have just been aphids or something like that uh, and they actually found that there was um, no it wasn't American elms I'm sorry it was another hemlock study uh, they found that there was a spike in in mites um, and after they applied imidacloprid it, it led to uh, a, a kind of a boon in uh, mite populations so there's something about neonics uh, that actually is beneficial uh, for arachnids and ticks are arachnids they're not insects um, so uh, uh, neonics are not effective against ticks. They just don't, uh, it, they don't bother them at all. Um, there are other alternatives to, uh, to neonics that you could use for ticks. I, I'm definitely not an expert in that realm, um, so I, I wouldn't want to give you a specific recommendation. But what I do uh, always tell people is that, you know, I remember growing up, my mom would always tell me to stay out of the tall grass, right? That was just a thing. There's ticks in the tall grass. Don't stay out of there. Um, that's not really tick habitat. Where ticks want to be is in a, a woodland. Uh, they want to be, you know, in the understory of a woodland. Their bodies are uh, very susceptible to desiccation. Uh, so they want to be in kind of a moist, dark, shady environment. Uh, a lot of times those like tall grass meadows are just too dry, too hot, uh, too sunny um, for, for ticks. Um, so uh, what, so basically think a little bit more about the life cycle of ticks. Um, a lot of the plants that I mentioned this evening will actually create habitat. That Fregaria virginiana that I uh, showed you before, uh, that's probably something that's going to be good tick habitat. Uh, and maybe something if you're concerned about ticks that you should shy away from. Um, 
but also understanding that ticks really like to be in those sort of moist, shady woodland edges. Uh, so around the edges of your grass, uh, I've seen a lot of tick recommendations where um, you might put a strip of, uh, of, of um, uh, wood chips around the edge of, of, your, um, of your forest uh, to provide sort of a desert uh, where ticks won't really cross. Um, just do a little bit more research on, on tick habitat, uh, how you might prevent them. And then they're just sort of a reality in this area. Uh, and, you know, I've got three kids myself. We do chick tick checks all the time. Uh, we go on a lot of hikes in the woods. Um, we have a dog. She brings home a lot of ticks. And it's just part of our routine is just doing tick checks, making sure that we're, uh, we're picking them off when we see them, uh, and making sure that we're being really careful not to bring them into the, into the house, uh, but also not letting it modify our behavior too much. We love to be outdoors. We love to walk through the woods. Uh, we love to be out in the garden. Uh, and, you know, we want to make sure that we can do those things uh, and, and do so in a, in a safe way. Um, we, we always just make sure that we, walk, we look at ourselves and, and check for ticks when we come back in. Um, but thank you for that question. It's, it's, it's always a tough subject. Um, any other questions? All right. Well, I appreciate you sticking around. I know we were uh, meant to end at 7.30. Uh, thanks for hanging around. As I mentioned, this presentation will be posted on Tower Hill's website. Um, so if you, wanna, if you wanna view it again, or if you wanna tell your friends, um, please feel free to uh, look for it in a couple of days. It'll be up there relatively soon. Um, and again, I thank you all for joining me this evening. Uh, visit our website, towerhillbg.org. Uh, we've got a lot of fantastic online resources up there. And if you're interested in that online trip don't forget about it. It's tomorrow evening. You can find out how to register for it um, uh, uh, by looking at our website. Uh, so thank you all and hope to see you next week. Thank you. So long. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.